Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is the Bond Life Sciences Center, which many of you already know is committed to interdisciplinary, collaborative kinds of things. Uh, interdisciplinary means uh, even outside the sciences, and we're going outside some of the sciences on this trip. Um, but w something we feel here is that our science isn't done until people know about it, uh, especially if you're paying taxes. I think you ought to know about it. Uh, so uh, that makes tonight's speaker particularly germane for our interest, both in epigenetics and communicating science. She, she's published three books, uh, all of them having something to do with learning, which is her favorite topic. Um, these books have been very well received. One is actually forthcoming. It's called Brilliant, the New Science of Smart. I'm really hoping I can pick something up there. <laughs> Smarts, for example. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the other, the first was the cult of personality, uh, but the one that brings us to, brings her to us tonight is this one: origins, how the nine months before birth shape the rest of our lives. Uh, how might that happen? Well, as a person interested in learning, uh, Annie Murphy Paul is interested in learning that starts at gestation. So let's welcome Annie to tell us about what she thinks. So thank you so much, Jack, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for coming um, from all over the country and, and across the globe to discuss the latest findings in epigenetics and the topic of my talk tonight, how to communicate these findings to the public. Um, so I stand before you tonight as a battle-hardened veteran of the effort to publicize epigenetic research. Uh, I wrote about such research in uh, my book, Origins, uh, which came out in 2010, which was on the science of prenatal influences. And at that time, when the book was published, the word epigenetic was still unfamiliar to most uh, members of the general public. And I've continued to write and talk about epigenetics since the book came out. And uh, over that time, I've seen the public's familiarity with epigenetics grow. And with that growing familiarity has come increasingly strong feelings and opinions. Um, now, let me be clear, many of the reactions to epigenetic research that I encounter have been positive, uh, curiosity, fascination, excitement, hope, um, but I've also been confronted with a broad range of, of you might say, more complicated emotions. Uh, so consider the following a field guide uh, for handling the public's reactions to reports of epigenetic research. Um, my plan is to go through one by one the responses that um, scientists uh, and others may run into as they speak and write about epigenetics. And I'll, I'll also share what I have found to be the most helpful way of, of handling these reactions. Um, so number one, puzzlement. Uh, since I write about pregnancy and origins, I thought I would use babies to, to illustrate my points. Um, puzzlement is often the people's first reaction first response upon learning about epigenetics. It doesn't fit with what they think they know about genetics, um, which is that genes form a kind of unalterable blueprint that is permanently established at conception. This is what they think they know about, about genetics. And many of them remember from their high school biology course the scorn kind of heaped on Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. You all remember like the giraffe getting a longer neck because it kept reaching for the, for the high up leaves and then passing that on to their, their offspring. So that's still in their minds. And um, they're, so they're confused about reports of a mechanism that seems to imply that uh, acquired characteristics can be passed on in, under some circumstances. Um, and I find that the most effective way to respond to this puzzlement is, you know, of course, to offer a clear explanation of epigenetic processes. 
and in particular to directly address the misconceptions that people may have about how genes operate. So reaction number two is skepticism. <laughs> Uh, some members of the public find accounts of epigenetic processes just too fantastic to believe. It just doesn't seem possible that, for example, multiple generations might be affected by a single exposure to a harmful chemical. Um, and I find that the most effective way to respond to this skepticism is to readily acknowledge that the science of epigenetics is still in its infancy and many of its theories, you know, all of its theories require further research, uh, but also to explain what we do know and why we think our theories are correct. Uh, so reaction number three is anxiety. <laughs> uh, following the publication of Origins, by far the most common reaction that I encountered from readers was anxiety. And many of these readers were pregnant women or women who had recently given birth, and they were worried that something that they did or were doing was damaging their fetus. Um, and I think it's important, first of all, to understand where this anxiety is coming from. So I'd like to share with you a passage that I wrote after Origins came out. <clears throat> uh, for months after the book's publication, women approached me at bookstore signings, at school events, at the supermarket, with furrowed brows and hesitant voices. Each time I knew what was coming next, a question about what she did or was doing or planned to do during pregnancy and how it would hurt her fetus. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this anxiety and its sources, and here's what I've concluded. Those of us who become pregnant in the early 21st century are part of a transitional generation located somewhere between the rumors and superstitions of the past, and <clears throat> the firm knowledge, I hope, of the future. We know much more than we once did. We know much less than we someday will. And that's an uncomfortable position to be in. Anxiety is the predictable result. You can't fault pregnant women for wanting answers and wanting them right now. But such answers are not always available, and even when they are, they haven't always been discernible in the din of media speculation and scaremongering. So we'll get to that media scaremongering in a minute, but um, in terms of talking to these women, I found that the most effective way to respond to their anxiety is to remind them of all the enormously positive effects that they have on their fetus, simply by eating well, um, getting prenatal care, taking care of their health and their, their own well-being, all things that they were probably doing already. And I often also make a pitch for the intellectual excitement that I feel about epigenetic research and that I think news of this research should, should evoke. Here's what I, a passage that I wrote in Origins. Pregnancy is now something it's never been before, a frontier. The nine months of gestation are at the leading edge of scientists' efforts to cure disease, to improve public health, to end vicious cycles of poverty, infirmity, and illness, and to initiate virtuous cycles of health, strength, and stability. Life on a frontier can be nerve-wracking, no question, but it's also among the most interesting and invigorating places to spend your time. I'm not sure if I persuaded any pregnant women of that, but that's what I, that's what I tell them. Um, so response number four to the news of epigenetic research is frustration. Um, another encounter, another research, I, uh, sorry, another reaction I encountered, again, often from women who, were current, who are currently um, or were recently pregnant was frustration at the limitations of science as it stands now. Its inability at this point to provide hard and fast rules for what pregnant women should do or shouldn't do. Uh, its inability to provide definite answers regarding the effects of epigenetic processes in humans. And I found that the most effective way to respond to this frustration was to sympathize with the legitimate lament that we, we don't yet know more. Um, and, uh, and it was also helpful to be clear about what we do know 
and to offer reassurance that science is moving ahead on these questions. Um, so number five, reaction number five is uh, fatalism. Um, yeah, it's hard to find a fatalistic looking baby, but I thought that was pretty, I thought that was pretty good. Um, in, in Origins, I noted that the eminent Harvard psychologist Jerome Kagan has written of the dangers of what he calls infant determinism. In other words, the misguided assumption that the experiences of very early childhood forge a permanent template for the rest of life. And one reaction I have encountered to epigenetic research might be called fetal determinism. So let me give you an example. Um, an article I wrote about epigenetic processes um, became the subject of a critical story that appeared in the online magazine Slate. Um, the article was written by a guy named Darshak Sanghavi. Uh, he's a pediatric cardiologist at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. So th this came out before, or before I finished Origins while I was writing magazine articles about epigenetic research in preparation for writing the book. So Sanghavi observed that he already sees the notion of fetal origins, the idea that, that some diseases and, and other conditions begin in the womb. He already sees that creeping into his practice, and that troubles him. Um, he, this is what he wrote, turning to the womb to explain complex social and public health problems ultimately means people have given up on changing the things that really matter. That's too bad. The truth is that nothing in this world worth having comes easy. And as any hardworking student who made it to college, any overweight person who's changed his or her lifestyle, or any adult who's worked through depression can tell you, at some point you have to stop blaming your issues on your mother's uterus. So I don't think I was doing that, but um, he, he raised some legitimate concerns about how epigenetic research is being interpreted. So I decided to meet with Sanghavi in person and talk through his critique. Um, and our meeting was friendly and you know, open-minded and, and not defensive at all. Um, he told me that he's concerned that if we become convinced that our destinies are determined in the womb, then society will no longer be willing to invest um, in, the, in the welfare of individuals after they're born. Um, and he said, why bother funding children's health initiatives or universal preschool if physical and cognitive functioning have been set in utero, he asked me. So, you know, he was worried that um, if, if the idea that our fate is sealed in the womb becomes common uh, conventional wisdom, then society's support for post-birth interventions will, will drop off. Um, so I found Sanghavi's caution a useful one. And in fact, I responded to it in Origins. Um, and this is the language that I used. Prenatal experience doesn't force the individual down a particular path. At most, it points us in a general direction. And we can take another route if we choose. Imagine water flowing downstream. Prenatal, prenatal influences might dig a canal, so to speak, making it easier for the water to flow one way instead of another. But with the efforts Sanghavi describes, we may be able to channel our fates in a different direction. The theory of fetal or origins ought to contribute to complexity, not reduce it. If we take care in how we think about prenatal influences, they may add another layer to our understanding of who we are and how we got this way. So um, that's what I wrote in Origins. Um, in general, I find that the most effective way to respond to the sense of fatalism about you know, everything is already set in the womb is to point out that there are many, many influences that shape the human organism, and no single influence is going to be determinative. Um, so the, uh, num the reaction number six to the news of epigenetic research is alarmism. Um, unlike the very, I think, reasonable and nuanced critique that I received from Darshak Sanghavi, uh, many media accounts, accounts of epigenetic research are irresponsibly sensational and even untruthful. Um, no doubt many of you have seen media coverage that screams something like, don't eat that or your child may grow up fat, uh, or stress in the womb makes people, sorry, 
stress in the womb makes kids dumber. Those are both two, two actual headlines. <clears throat> um, and I, I find that you know, the most effective way to respond to such media alarmism is to counter it with a calm and level-headed explanation of what we know about epigenetic processes and their effects, emphasizing the multifaceted nature of, of human development. And I think it's also useful to address specific exaggerations and falsehoods when, when possible, um, offering readers an empirically supported alternative to um, the hype that they encounter in the, in the media. Um, so reaction number seven to the news of uh, epigenetic research. At, at one point, I was going to frame this as like the seven stages of, of grief, but there's, I actually had more than seven reactions to epigenetic research. So <laughs> you can see what a complex topic this is, so many reactions. Um, number seven is blame. Um, <laughs> one of the more surprising responses to epigenetic research that I encountered was an aggressive kind of blame um, directed at people who would be more fairly described as, as victims of epigenetic um, processes. For example, women who experience traumatic stress or um, poor nutrition during their pregnancies. Um, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised because mother blaming has a very long uh, history in American culture. Um, and we also often engage in a kind of blinkered insistence on personal responsibility, even um, in the face of overwhelmingly powerful external conditions that, that shape people's behavior. Um, so I find that the most effective way to explain to this, uh, to respond to this kind of blaming is to explain that while people are responsible for their own behavior, inadequate knowledge and insufficient resources may lead people to make poor choices. Um, and that people are also subject to just plain old bad luck. Um, and in addition, many processes involving epigenetic mechanisms are beyond the power of any individual to control. Um, for example, the pervasiveness of, of potentially harmful chemicals uh, in our environment. And so that fact should provoke not a blaming of individuals, but a commitment to improve our collective lot. Um, so reaction number eight that I've encountered to epigenetic research is anger. Um, now, if I found the tendency to blame surprising, I was even more unprepared for the anger that was directed at me uh, when I published Origins. Um, after the book came out, some readers claimed that I was heaping additional anxiety on uh, with pregnant women who already were contending with a barrage of, of misogynistic messages. Um, now, I, I said that these are readers, um, you know, that these were readers who, who claimed that I was uh, heaping these, these messages on pregnant women, but I don't think that they actually had read my book. I think that if they did, they would have come away with quite a different impression of my intentions. Um, Rather, it's that I and other bearers of news about epigenetic research often become convenient targets. We become lightning rods for more general concerns about how women are treated and how scientific findings are interpreted. Um, so I find that the most effective way to respond to this kind of anger is to sympathize with the pressure and the confusion that pregnant women feel from all the conflicting messages that they're receiving from all sides. Um, and I also find it helpful to calmly explain that I'm really not engaged in blaming individuals, but, in bringing a but I'm engaged in bringing attention to findings that ultimately can actually help people. So reaction number nine to epigenetic research, there's, this, there's only 10, <laughs> uh, is unease. Um, occasionally when I'm communicating with the public about uh, epigenetic research, um, I hear concerns about what people often call genetic engineering. Um, the, the worry that epigenetic mechanisms will be used to design a superior race, kind of, um, you know, a designer baby kind of thing. Um, and I find that the most effective way to respond to this kind of an unease is to 
sympathize with the individual's concern about all the unknowns about epigenetic research and its applications, um, but also to emphasize that these kind of brave new world scenarios are not now being enacted and are unlikely to transpire in the future. Um, so finally, uh, number 10, the um, last re response that I encounter to uh, the news of epigenetic research is, is polarization. Um, this is a really tricky one um, because news of epigenetic research tends to generate political polarization around the issue of abortion. Um, some readers of Origins, for example, took me to task for using the word fetus instead of the word baby, um, uh, or claimed that evidence that the fetus is affected by epigenetic processes in the womb as evidence that it is a person in the sense um, of the word used by abortion opponents. So my own approach to this thorny issue uh, has been to say that in my writing, I'm focused on the effect of epigenetic processes on fetuses that are brought to term, uh, and that I don't believe that epigenetic research on the prenatal period uh, leads directly to any political pronouncements, for example, regarding when life begins. Um, so I'd like to close my talk tonight uh, with an account of one of my favorite responses, the response I really liked, uh, to, to my writing on epigenetic research, a response that actually came in the form of a visual image um, let me show it to you. Um, as I wrote in a prologue to the paperback edition of Origins, framed and hanging on my wall, the wall of my house is the original of the illustration by artist Shannon May that accompanied the New York Times review of Origins. It shows an image of an egg, its white sh shell and yellow yolk marked with arrows in the manner of a scientific diagram pointing out all that could go wrong in its gestation too much chicken scratch, too loud in the hen house, low in the pecking order, sky was falling. Um, so I love this drawing for its elegant shapes and subtle colors, but most of all for its gentle humor about a fraught subject. Despite all the chicken littles out there, the sky is not falling. Rather, for pregnant women and the fetuses they carry, the sky is now the limit. The science of fetal origins is opening up unprecedented possibilities for prevention and intervention, for giving birth to a generation that is healthier and happier than any, than any that came before. It also promises to, introduce, to produce new insights about what I consider to be the most interesting question on earth. What makes us the way we are? That inexhaustible inquiry brings me back to the place where I began, where we all began, the womb. So thank you very much for your attention, your attention and I'd love to hear your questions. Does anyone have a question? Questions? I'm going to start calling on you. If you want. OK, yes. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. The difference would have to do with uh, more extensiveness of epigenetic influences even before you conceived the baby or something. Mm -hmm. um, so do you make that distinction with them or you know, how does that enter into your book? Well, I think the occasion for pregnant women to feel anxiety is each new report of, a, of an epigenetic finding. Um, as well as um, the finding that what a pregnant woman does during pregnancy could potentially affect not just her offspring, but her offspring's offspring. I mean, it's kind of like a multiplier effect on her guilt, basically. <laughs> so um, I, think, I think you're right that certainly pregnant women felt anxiety before anyone knew what um, epigenetics was. But um, because epigenetics is so much in the news, it becomes the occasion on which w women feel lectured or um, scolded or made to feel anxious. 
Uh, allow me to interject that mm. if you stick with us for the symposium, you will hear at least one talk that blames dad. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is not limited mm. to mom. Okay? Equal opportunity, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. We don't know if that's going to have an effect on the babies, but nonetheless, this mom's emotion, that's what we need to be happening, I think, across the country. I mean, we need to start getting and implementing this early on. Right, right. And that's what is so dangerous, I think, about that sense of fatalism, because it stops that kind of intervention or that kind of activity in its tracks. And so that's why we have to push it back against that fatalism, I think. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I think it's exciting. I think both, though, that we need to invest in these postnatal, you know, kind of early work areas and even the postnatal. I mean, there, there's no, I mean, your argument that you had with your this, uh, professor, I don't, you know, we can still intervene. I agree with you on that point, but I think we should also be putting resources into that perinatal period. Not just the prenatal period, but before pregnancy, after pregnancy. Yeah, I mean, the whole perinatal period. Yeah, I, you won't get any argument with me from that. Yeah. Yes, up there. Uh huh. Right, right. Right. Right, right. Yes, I think you're right. And that's why I so much want to get across the message that, that there's so much to be hopeful about with this science. And that's not always the way it's interpreted, but I think um, there's a lot of reason to be hopeful. Um, yes, May. I have a question. I have a question. This is actually not a question. It's a comment. Whenever there's an emerging science, the women, the pregnant women, is always the first one to be focused on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this has been repeating itself. So I think epigenetics is such a broad science. It brought a lot of cure and new developments and new understandings of our entire life stage. And I think that we absolutely have to dismiss this myth of only focusing a reductionist method back to the woman. We don't want to put pregnant women into a bubble again. Yeah, all right. Shauna, did you have a question? Yeah. Hold it close to your mouth. Thank you for that talk and I have a I, I actually this is asking for advice <laughs> so um, one of the things that I've encountered when people say to me could my son's mm -hmm. small penis or my son's <laughs> this problem or this problem have come from <laughs> my doing X Y and Z and yeah and yeah right? and so what I tell them and I'm not good at this and that's where I want your yeah advice, yeah is to convey the difference between an individual effect and a population effect. Right, and I right. I think what we're looking at here is population mm -hmm, effects. Mm -hmm. So these things matter a mm -hmm, lot mm -hmm. for society, mm -hmm. but probably not for you 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a very hard message to get across. And yes. I love your advice on how to do that. Well, I I'm not sure that I'm in. I mean, it seems like what you just said would be the right thing to tell somebody. But I too get those questions, and they're kind of heartbreaking. You know, someone will say. My mother's sister died when she was pregnant with me, and I think maybe that's why I've struggled with depression all my life, you know? And it, it's just, it's so, um, there's something so mysterious, and I think that's why the prenatal period pregnancy has been the focus of so many superstitions and old wives' tales, I mean, for, for all of history. And it's this murky nine-month period, and it's so easy to project onto it our fears and our, our anxieties. So I think the best we can do is to say something like what you said about a population effect versus an individual effect while expressing, you know, sympathy for, for the person. Um, because sometimes I feel like that's not even really what they're asking. You know, I'm not sure that even the clearest, crispest scientific explanation is going to be satisfying. Do you know? Yeah. Up there? Yeah, so it certainly is reasonable to focus on epigenetics because they're involved in differentiation and that's occurring beginning at the earliest stages of embryonic development. But one of the things to cite that follows up on what Chuck May Ho was talking about, don't just focus on the pregnant woman and the fetus, is that if you look at the twin data, the epigenome is increasing in differences between twins as they get older. Right, right. So there's an answer to the fatalism. Right, that epigenetic processes continue to operate all throughout our lives. That's, that's right. That's a really critical point that right. we don't want to lose by just focusing on the early developmental period. I know. It's a very difficult balancing act because you want to emphasize how important those early periods are while not suggesting at the same time that if those early periods are deficient in some way that the game is up, you know, it's, 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 it's really tough. Um, Thank yeah. you for, for the talk, I really enjoyed it, but I want to know how you approach um, closer. I can, I, I, can, I can be very loud, my mother said so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, from your talk, I, I I gather uh, epigenetics as being something that can go wrong. Yeah. Rather than something that has to happen right. for development and for life to occur, right? Right. right. So uh, how do you approach the public and tell them that this is something that needs to happen? Yeah. And it's not only bad or fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And that's why I try to emphasize to pregnant women that Everything that they're already doing to take care of themselves during pregnancy is, is exactly what is going to help their offspring be healthy and happy, you know, but... Um, but that even if they don't do anything, it's something that's going to happen. It's going to happen. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in psychology, there's a maxim, you know, borne out by research that bad is stronger than good, you know? So I think people, people focus on the negative, they focus on the, you know, you, want, you desperately want your baby to be born healthy, and so we just have to keep saying it, um, but I think it's, it's natural that people are gonna focus on the risks rather than the upsides. It should be oh. Hello? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Um. So in, in my work in autism, I get lots of emails, <laughs> and some you know some of them are oh I think it's this, uh, and then and then a lot of them are also about people planning or they're already pregnant or what have you. Right. And um, you know I I have in fact recently I spent a lot of time writing responses because of a paper that had just come out, and a lot of people being very concerned of, because of certain things that well. Basically, we had just published a paper about pesticides, and um, the week that our paper came out, um, uh, we had um, uh, the West Nile virus uh, it reached its peak in many co counties in California, and so uh, the counties were spraying 
uh, pesticides that were pretty closely related to the pesticides we had just published about. So right. it, it was, people were very, ups some people were very, very, very upset about yeah. that. So, um, uh, you know, I ended up writing many of the things that other people were saying here about, but one of the things that I really emphasized was that this is, you know, and I think many of the other things you're talking about, depression or uh, cancer, um, I have um, multiple factors, mm -hmm. and it's it's almost never mm -hmm. one single thing right. that you know produce is there is no the cause. Right. There are right. multiple causes, and they work together. And you know, uh, so you know the issue of that you do you do positive things. Th those may actually attenuate any of the you know the harmful effects of, of some of these other things, and so right. it's, it's always a, a very complex kind of uh, process that you know child early child development is, and right. yeah, things can go wrong, but uh, but but there's a lot of resilience, and, right? And that you know it, it's it's complex, and right. you could probably never know what caused that that woman to have depression all her life, right? Right, which is. A very unsatisfying answer for people. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it is the reality. But it's the reality. It's the reality, but there's also the human tendency to look for that one reason why, you know, and that's something we're probably always going to have to grapple with. I'm going, or you can start yelling. Yeah. But then if, if there were any uh, of the other ones that had maybe been a little bit also noticeable size effect. And then also, I was hoping you could share with us, uh, if there were any others like me who haven't had the good fortune of reading your book, how you explain epigenetics to the reader or mm -hmm. what your impression of the public's understanding of epigenetics is. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Because that's often such a crucial point right, for right. this interpretation. Right, right. Um, you know, the there were there were a lot of reactions to my book that were on the spectrum of you know interest, excitement, curiosity, but those tend to be milder responses compared to the people who got really worked up, and that would be the people who were anxious, the people who um, blamed me for for kind of putting more pressure on them. That would I think be another really strong reaction that I encountered. Um, and I think that unease was was pretty common. Also, it's just um, it just makes people worried um, because it's not familiar, and it, it's because the stakes seem so high. So um, I wish I could say that curiosity and open mindedness were the the most frequent responses. Um, but maybe maybe the ones you know it's a self selected sample. The ones that I hear from are the people who have very strong, maybe negative. Um, concerns about the book. Um, as for how I explained epigenetics in my, in my book, it's interesting. We had a, a little panel discussion earlier today with all the epigenetics researchers that are here, and there were, there were at least three different definitions of epigenetics um, among the experts. So I think what I said was something, you know, I, I didn't get into great, great detail in, in, about epigenetics in my book, um, and my book was very much a book intended for a general lay audience. So I think I said it was something like um, uh, the effects of uh, the way that the environment modifies the expression of genes. I, I tried to get across the idea that there's genes, and then there's the there's the genome, and then there's the epigenome, which is which. Um, you know, determines whether genes are turned on or turned off or turned up or turned down. And I think, I think people kind of get that. Um, but I think there's a long way to go in terms of your, the final part of your question in terms of educating the public. I'm sure there are lots of people who have no idea what epigenetics is um, and who still think that, you know, your DNA, your, your, your genetic inheritance is a blueprint inherited at conception that plays itself out without any kind of modification from the environment. So um, the audience 
here today, I'm sure, is very educated and sophisticated about it. Another audience may never have heard the word before. So it, all, it depends. Thanks. Well, it's funny that you say that the audience here is very knowledgeable about uh -huh. it because I don't feel knowledgeable about it. So uh -huh. I just came to kind of find, learn a little bit. And so I guess I'm very curious. Maybe I was if, flattering you. <laughs> yeah, if you could give like three of the clearest or strongest kinds of examples that you wrote about in your book of epigenetics that you were trying to convey to the general audience, I think that would be really helpful. I hope I'm not the only person that doesn't know it really well. I think that hopefully you're reaching a lot more people here. Yes, yeah. Um, okay, so I feel like... I should call up one of the, the real experts on epigenetics. Do you want to come up here, May, and maybe give me a couple? No. <laughs> Massimo? What, examples? Yeah, could you, could you offer an example of um, an epigenetic effect that would be clearly understandable by the general public? Uh, lots of environmental stresses um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, alter gene expression. This is actually an adaptive uh, response in a lot of organisms, not just human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, but that outer gene expression then has effects on, let's say, uh, triggers a starvation kind of response. So you uh, save energy, um, and then, but if you're having offspring in the making, right. that means you're actually provisioning that right. offspring less. Right. So an environmental stress causes, sorry, thank you. An environmental stress uh, causes a, essentially going to a sa energy saving mode. Right. Uh, by way of altering gene expression, if you're about to nurture or produce offspring, that sa saver, same energy mode uh, saving thing uh, actually affects the fitness uh, of the offspring. This is not just true in human beings, it's true in plants even. Uh -huh. and, and as well as in you know, lots of different species of animals. But there's a bunch of different examples. They all go through different molecular mechanisms. Yeah. But it's a common phenomenon. Yes. No, yeah. It's interesting you asked the, ph the philosopher for an example. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I tell the story in my book about um, what's known as the Dutch hunger winter. And this is when um, uh, cities in, in the Netherlands were uh, blockaded, uh, came under siege by the Nazis during World War II. And um, this, you know, well developed, rich Western country. Uh, its population, part of its population, was living in starvation conditions for months and months and months through a very harsh winter. And there were many women who were pregnant during that time. And because the Dutch kept incredibly good records um, of like the baby's birth weights, for example, we know a little bit about uh, what happened to those babies who, whose mothers were malnourished um, because of the Nazis' um, blockade. Um, during the course of that winter. And what happened is that many of those babies were born uh, at low birth weights, but otherwise seemed normal and um, seemed to grow up, n you know, normally. Um, but those babies um, developed much higher rates of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, in middle age. And the, it was not known at the time why when this effect was first discovered, why that would be the case. But the thinking now is that these women, um, all their bodies knew was that they were living in starvation conditions. That message was transmitted to their fetuses, basically a message of this is a world where resources are scarce. Your bodies better hang on to every calorie. This is the message that the fetuses got, you know, from their mother's bodies. Then the babies were born, and the Nazi blockade was lifted, and these babies actually grew up in a world that was very different from the ones that they their bodies were prepared for in utero. They grew up in a, a Western country that where resources and food were abundant, and so the mismatch between the message that they got in utero, which um, through epigenetic processes changed the expression of their genes, the mismatch between that anticipated existence and the actual existence that they came to live as members of this you know, um, rich Western society led to increased um, rates of, of these diseases. So 
that's an example of an epigenetic effect. Does that, is, is that, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, okay, good. We actually have three more volunteers at least to give examples. <laughs> a, a good example that we can think of is a very large study, several repeated, called the tr identical twin studies. So their genetical materials are the same. They live in the same mother the, in the womb. So their maternal environment, the pre prenatal environment are the same. But as they get older, their health outcomes are different because it depends on how they live their life throughout their lives. So, some, so that is something that actually gives hope that it's not just everything all set in the womb and that's it, the end of the story. That is a really good, perfect example of how epigenetics is subjected to continuous editing. That means we, by interacting with the environment on a daily basis, two identical twins, if they live their life differently, or some, in some cases, they are adopted to different families. So that affects their health and disease outcome in a very different way. So that really talks about Lifelong editing of your epigenome. Thank you. Mark. All right, I'm coming, Frank. Unless you want to start. Oh, well, I can start now. Okay. So I'm going to offer an alternative uh, hypothesis regarding the Dutch winter. Okay. Which is that a substantial number of those pregnancies did not come to term. Uh huh. And so, children who were unable to compete in a low environment because not because of their epigenome but because of their genome. Uh huh died uh -huh. and, and did not reach the age where they might have been subject to cardiovascular. So from, from what little I know about it, it's impossible to rule out a straight Mendelian effect in that case. And it's, you know, in, in fact, a lot of this epigenetics brings back memories of 30 years ago with the gay gene or the... Um, uh, the wife beating gene or the alcoholism gene or something like that. And we, we have a tendency to overdetermine what we barely know. And uh, I think that that's an issue with this subject as well as many others. I, I, I totally agree with you. And that's why I have, I think, at every turn, urged for a more nuanced and more sophisticated understanding of, of epigenetics. But I, I do think, as a follow-up, it is really critical to point out that there is now such extensive evidence that intrauterine growth restriction creates this uh, mismatch referred to as the thrifty phenotype, where the predisposition of these individuals is that they're fetally developing in a world of starvation, and then they end up in a world of plenty. And the impact on cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity is now, uh, we've published on that in animal models. It, I mean, it's absolutely clear. And the human data on that are just robust. So um, I think there is an underlying mechanism there. Mary, may I jump in briefly? Sure, Jack. Uh, I've had Oliver Arena also wants to I've jump I've had to explain this to non-technical <laughs> audiences a lot, uh, most recently on the Paul Pepper radio show, if you care to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And um, you, you may notice that um, the two of us don't look all that much alike. <laughs> okay? I picked a man, though. <laughs> All right. You do kind of uh, look alike, yet, actually. And yet, <laughs> and yet we have a lot of genes in common. And the point uh, I drive home here is that you are not your genes. You are what your genes are doing. Some are on, some are off. The ones on the top of my head that regulate hair growth are currently off. <laughs> All right. uh, and the way I look, the way I am, almost all the details has to have to do with how genes are being, what we say, expressed. Are they turned on, turned off, up or down, okay? What's unique, a unique finding here, is that whether a gene is turned up or down, on or off, can be pa that condition can be passed to the next generation. So if genes turn on or off in response to your environment, 
and they stay on or off, then your offspring are responding as though they were in your environment. That's why this argument about the, the diets of the parents and the offspring has come up. Okay? Most of the time we're talking about complex things that are regulated by lots of different genes. There isn't a gene for hair on the top of my head. All right? There are lots of genes involved in that. There isn't a gene for schizophrenia. There are lots of genes involved. Lots of genes get turned on and off together <laughs> to do accomplish various jobs. But the unique thing about uh, epigenetics is the ability or the finding that what's on, what's off, can be passed to the next generation. We really didn't expect that in, until very recently. Now, we, I have a room full of experts here, and you want to hammer me on that? Are we okay with that? Mm -hmm. They're nodding their heads. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm safe. <laughs> So in terms of a good example of epigenetics and even a transgenerational effect, I think it was probably the sad, um, example of an epigenetic and a transgenerational effect was probably the saddest event in human history, but in, from the 1950s to the early 1970s, moms were given DES, diethylstebesterol, that's an estrogen, under the misguided notion it would prevent miscarriage. We know that those babies born from that have gone on to develop serious issues, um, whether they be cancers or developmental defects. Now, that would necessarily indicate that it's an epigenetic or genetic change, but this is what it comes in more, it becomes sadder and likely uh, shows it is an epigenetic change, is the grand offspring, including like the daughter, the daughter those granddaughters, are developing the same types of tumors, like these vaginal tumors that their moms did. And these granddaughters were not exposed directly to diethylstebesterol. Their only exposure was when their mom was in, their mom was in utero, her germ cells were being exposed to that same chemical. That's likely evidence of what we call an epigenetic and even a transgenerational effect, which has been also shown with the Dutch hunger syndrome. So there is ample evidence of this. And again, this is probably about the saddest though one where we did this to ourselves. I'd like to ask the lady in the back, it's your question answered yet. <laughs> yes, thank you, okay. <laughs> All right, good. Who else has a question for our speaker? Okay, I'm coming. Or you can start yelling. Tomorrow I'll get two mics up. All right, so you've seen a lot more of the public's reaction to this kind of thing than most of the people that are like writing these papers and coming out with this all, all this data and conveying it to the public and all that. So what do you think for the future, how should we look at kind of epigenetics, how should we address it to the public in a way that's gonna cause less of these reaction, these negative reactions you're seeing? Like what's the best way to do that in your opinion to do that as we come out with more and more papers and, yeah, and books yeah. and all that fun stuff. Yeah. Well, I think first it's important to really clearly explain what epigenetics is and what we know about it. Maybe I kind of fell down on that today. Um, second, I think we need to, um, as you were saying, point out that epigenetic processes are operating all the time. And as May said, you know, throughout our entire lives, it's not like just something bad and just something that happens during the prenatal period. It's, it's this, it's how life happens. Um, and third, I think um, we need to push back against some of the more sensationalistic or um, misleading portrayals of epigenetic research that are out there. Um, and fourth, I think we need to really stress the upside of epigenetic research, not just the, the, you know, the, the fact that epigenetic processes are always operating, but the fact that we may be able to use epigenetic research to intervene in really proactive ways to do things we haven't been able to do in other ways, like um, you know, stop, as I was saying, stop kind of cycles of, of disease. Um, maybe even intervene um, after a fetus has had a less than ideal uh, gestation. You know, a woman who 
drank during drank a lot drank heavily during pregnancy there may be a way to reverse you know the effects of 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 that exposure to alcohol things like that there's it's a really exciting um, frontier, a really exciting cutting edge, and I think the more that we can convey that to people, the the more it becomes not something to dread or to to be afraid of, but something to look hopefully towards. Let me just add, while we're seeing if there's any more questions, I got asked a lot of questions as director, and I'm not like you. I'm not and someone who does epigenetics research myself, but I had to learn a bunch of things and come up with a lot of um, explanations because I would be asked questions by the media or by people all the time. And one of the things, so the, sh the example Cheryl just gave about intergenerational effects of a medication that's given to women, and not only are the children that they had, right, not only the children who are affected when they're in the womb having these effects, but actually the daughters of those women as well. Um, I just wanted to mention that the people sort of like you, what are the reactions I'm getting back from people of different ideas? And one of the things that seemed to be most convincing to people was, well, maybe this makes a much better, bigger difference about how I think about pollution. If the pollution isn't just what happens to me breathing it now, uh -huh. but it, what it happens over multiple generations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So. This is a little bit of an aside, but just it made me think of that, what you were saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That people seem to seem, find that a very fascinating and eye-opening kind of thing. One of these things that you talk about possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes a different kind of argument to people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Any more questions? You're all good. Should we give you a quiz? What is epigenetics <laughs> now? Okay, I won't actually do that. Thanks very much for coming Thank you. tonight.